Welcome back. You're still watching The Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. And uh, it's time to look at um, uh, the newspapers this morning right here on the program. Our guest is standing by. And when we are done uh, with going through those headlines, we'll introduce our guest um, and they'll get into the business of analyzing the headlines. All right. We start with um, the leadership newspaper this morning. Interesting uh, headlines from the leadership newspaper. How Tambuel's PDP presidential primary, how Tambuel's swung, or Tambuel's withdrawal swung 182 Northwest votes for Atiku. I don't know how Wiki supporters uh, will feel reading this headline. How Tambuel's withdrawal swung 182 Northwest votes for Atiku. Such a masterstroke. Hmm. Uh, more from the paper. Okada riders invade FCT estate, burn houses over colleagues' death. There we go again. Okada riders invade FCT estate, burn houses over colleagues' death. How Supreme Court ruling crumbled Rivers panel indictment over Amechi. How Supreme Court ruling crumbled Rivers panel indictment of Amechi. Wheat, wheat flour substitution fails on low cassava demand supply gap. Wheat flour substitution fails on low cassava demand supply gap. EFCCRS Yari over Accountant General's 48 billion naira probe. Flight with 22 passengers on board missing in Nepal. Terrorist attack, gun, train attack. Terrorists give fresh ultimatum. And finally, Obiano's wife, Odua Ekunife Una, Ekelekwe pick Senate. Tickets stories on the front page of leadership. Let's move next to the nation this morning. The following headline is a big one there. Presidency Buhari not part of plot to draft Jonathan into race. Presidency Buhari not part of plot to draft Jonathan into race. Ex-president not qualified to be a standard bearer, says National Working Committee member. Guess that puts paid to President Jonathan's ambition or talk of his ambition to be the next president. Eight children for release to train terrorists, uh, respite for captives. Primaries, 42 senators won't return, number likely to rise. Methodist prelate, bishop, kidnapped in Abia. Methodist prelate, bishop, kidnapped in Abia. Jimo Ibrahim, Obiano's wife, Bagudu, win Senate tickets. Uh, EFCC uncovers another 90 billion naira fraud against Accountant General. How Atiku struck last-minute deal with Tambuel to win ticket. How Atiku struck last-minute deal with Tambuel to win ticket. Lessons for APC from the PDP convention. Details on page 29. Pope names Nigerian Ogbaleke others cardinals. Suspect excretes 95 heroin pellets. And President signs 19 out of 131 bills passed by Senate in three years. Gunmen kill NPC chief. Some stories coming on the front page of The Nation. To the punch, Atiku's candidacy, pro-zoning forces angry, slam PDP, Tambuel. Pro-zoning forces angry, slam PDP, Tambuel. Tambuel's withdrawal, dubious, PDP's primary inequitable pandav others delegates inducement with money for stambul to step down governor's aid okay maybe some uh, some uh, image laundering there banks tighten forex access as res reserves hit seven month low efcc arrests iari alleges ex-governor got 22 billion naira largesse from accountant general Strike. We resume talks with federal government, says Asu and Sanu. I don't know if Zenab will say yes to me, says Ade Yanju, who rode motorcycle from London to Lagos. There's a video on the internet showing him asking for a hand in marriage. Um, we don't know if that's serious or not, but um, the man has obviously come out to say he's interested in her. More from the punch. Nigeria's internet population grows by 108.39%, now 80.68 million. Cabal's benefiting from petrol, petrol imports, frustrating local refineries, as according to Ipman. 
And uh, more from the punch, INEC chairman visits Ekiti ahead of June 18 governorship poll. Port Hackett Stampede, church mourns, traces victims, families, and the club shot. It's talking about the polo club. Lagos Telecom's accountant commits suicide, friend blames depression. And can PFN fumes, gunmen kidnap Methodist prelate others in Abia. I know um, Archbishop or the prelate, his eminence, uh, Dr. Uche, uh, fairly well, because I'm also a Methodist by birth and by... Uh, uh, by confirmation, and, uh, quite close to his daughter. Really, really worrying and sad news to read. Hope that uh, he's released as quickly as possible to go back home to his family. Over to the Daily Independent. APC presidential primary. Uh, team boost chances at risk over removal of statutory delegates. Party will be in trouble if he didn't emerge. It's coming from Swaga. Uh, says he is the only one that can defeat Atiku convincingly. FG banks on beleaguered telcos to boost revenue. Buhari distances itself from plot to draft Jonathan into presidential race. Atiku's PDP candidacy affront on us, Southern Middle Belt leaders. Atiku Ayu, Lamido, Iherio Hape, thank you, visit to Tambuo. EFCC arrests Governor Yari over alleged role in AGF's 80 billion Naira scam in 2023. Why Southeast shouldn't be schemed out of presidential race by Umahi. We have also more stories from the Independent. Uh, PDP cancels governorship National Assembly primaries in Eboi. And wanted drug lord arrested in Ondo. These are stories coming on the front page of the National Daily. Today, let's quickly welcome Bode Badebo, who is the online editor of the Leadership Newspaper. Mr. Badebo, thank you very much for your time and good morning to you. I told you, good morning. Thank you very much. We'll start with your newspaper, uh, the Leadership. Uh, how Tambo's withdrawal swung uh, 182 Northwest votes for Tiku. Just a brief one on that. Um, uh, obviously, Wiki and uh, his supporters will be disappointed at this. Uh, do you think that if Tambo had not withdrawn, Yes, so Wiki probably would have emerged as the winner? Well, I don't think so. I don't think so. You see, uh, politics uh, is the ability to negotiate and also win uh, uh, somebody towards yourself. But then, in the last contest we saw on our Saturday, organized by the People's Democratic Party, you will believe, or you agree with me, rather, that Atiku, former Vice President Atiku Abaka, was the only aspirant with the requisite political sagacity, you know, clouds and uh, structure everywhere across this country to win uh, that contest. So, he, regardless of any uh, master stroke, whether uh, whether Tambua uh, no, withdrew from the race or not, or whether anybody, you know, uh, dollarized the exercise or not, as equals to the chance uh, to win, and he actually won. All right, all right. We'll move on to from that. Of course, we'll have a look at that uh, more in depth in our first uh, conversation for the morning. Um, there's a paper, there's a story at the top uh, left corner of the uh, front page of the leadership talking about uh, Okada riders um, embarking on, on carnage and destruction again, this time in the FCT, where uh, the headline says Okada riders invade FCT estate, burn houses over colleagues' death. Um, it's, it's sad if indeed their colleague died. We don't know what happened. Uh, I've not read that story. But um, uh, Okada writers, again, should we be worried about this incident and what can be done to, to make sure that this, this group of people don't uh, continue to be a danger to society? Yeah, we should be worried. Uh, what is needed at this uh, point in time is regulation. I mean, not totally, you know, by the idea of a total ban, because when you ban these people from making a living, they will become, you know, more uh, dangerous menace to the society. Like what Lagos is doing, and you can see the reaction trailing the Lagos State Government decision. But what is important are these, uh, you know, Okada riding, well, is a menace, actually. But then, because of a uh, uh, lack of a uh, gainful employment, you see young people taking to Okada uh, riding to earn a living. But unfortunately, the larger part of these people are uneducated people. 
they don't have an interpersonal relationship with their passengers, you know, with communities where they found themselves. So in this uh, situation where we have found ourselves, and against the backdrop of what happened here in Abuja yesterday, I think what is important is urgent regulation. Anybody that wants to ride Okada should be known, should be registered by any agency that the government wants to create or that is existing already. And I can tell you, there will be peace. In case there is any uh, infraction, uh, anybody is violating the law, it's easy for us to trace the person, trace the person, identify the person, prosecute the person. But in this case now, we don't know who and who. We don't know who is an Okada rider. We don't know who is not. Everybody is just, you know, uh, constituting a nuisance in the society. And now, if the Abuja uh, incident yesterday is not actually punished, I can tell you this will continue. It will continue because it has happened before. It will continue. What happened in the day market here two weeks ago was as a result of uh, the same incident with Okada people. And good words, millions of Naira were destroyed at the Abuja uh, timber market in the suburb called Dede here in Abuja. So what is important now is for government to actually quickly move in to regulate Okada uh, riding. I want to tell you that uh, it's a necessary evil because a lot of people uh, don't uh, own personal cars and you need something to take you uh, to the front of your house. There are people who live in interior places. So it's a necessary evil. We have to live with it, but there is a need for urgent uh, regulation. All right. All right. Um, uh, uh, Bonnie, let's go stay with your paper. Um, uh, this headline, train attack, terrorists give fresh ultimatum. The story says that the terrorists who attacked the Abuja Kaduna train, uh, who uh, killing nine of the passengers and kidnapping over 60 others, uh, have withdrawn their earlier threat, thankfully, uh, to kill the remaining 62 passengers in captivity. And um, uh, the media consultant to Sheikh Ahmed Gumi uh, says that uh, they've given the federal government a fresh two-week ultimatum effective from today, Monday, uh, you know, that's what they're saying, to release their eight children in government custody. That's eight of the terrorist children in, in government cops custody. What are your thoughts on this? Well, you know, this kind of matter is a security matter. Government will never tell you what is, it is doing behind the scene to actually, you know, uh, overcome the challenge. But this, as it may, uh, it is natural that the families of those in captivity uh, will be worried. And they are always worried. I've, I've spoken to a couple of them, you know, they keep telling me the situation they found themselves. And uh, the media consultant to uh, popular Islamic cleric, uh, Dr. Gumi, that was spoken to by a terrorist, uh, Malan Tukumamu is also a well-known person to me. He, he resides in Kaduna. I spoke with him too. Uh, he told me, I, I don't know what I have to say this, uh, he told me that uh, the government is not actually on top of the situation. And this is the problem. The government needs to be on top of the situation to rescue these people alive so that they, they will continue to have faith in government. But as we are now, as we speak, it seems we don't have a government in place. These people, they table their demand. They say young people, their children, you know, they even call them underage. They were arrested and they were taken to an orphanage home in Yola, uh, the Adamawa state capital. So I think the question we should ask ourselves is where were those are kids arrested in the first place? And if they were suspected to be terrorists themselves, the government know the right thing to do. But in this, uh, in this instance, I think uh, the life of uh, innocent Nigerians in the hands of those uh, terrorists is uh, worth more than... Uh, the kids of these people, and it is important that the government come out to say, okay, we have your kid with us, take your kid and give us uh, our people back. You know, this is done everywhere around the world. Even advanced places like U.S. do what we call a prisoner swap with known terrorists. So I think the government should really do the needful mm -hmm. before uh, the terrorists will begin to do uh, uh, unpleasant things or untoward things. All right. Uh, um, uh, Sheikh Ahmed Gumi has, has um, not had um, uh, a, a warm reception, you know, in the Nigerian public or from the Nigerian uh, populace, especially in the southern part of the country. A lot of people view him as a, one of the, uh, you know, people sympathetic to bandits, you know, with his um, uh, previous attempts to interface between the country and the bandits. And uh, now we're hearing these stories. Uh, uh, passing mixed messages through us through his camp. That's uh, Gumi's camp. Um, is Gumi part of the problem? Should he be picked up by by the government to tell us more about what he knows about these and the location 
of his um, these terrorists? Uh, uh, Gumi is never part of the problem. This person uh, I've come in contact with since 2015. Uh, you know, when you uh, initiate something and that idea is misunderstood, there is nothing we will tell anybody. If the perception around the idea, you know, is biased from uh, inception, there is nothing you tell anybody. Now, Gumi himself is a full animal from Zampara State. And uh, when I met him uh, a few months ago, yeah, I think sometime last year, when he started this uh, peace initiative to Fulani camps uh, and terrorist forests and the rest of them, he told me that when he, he initiated that in order to separate the wheat from the chaff, in order for him to know who are the Fulanis suffering, uh, you know, unjust uh, uh, injustice from the Nigerian uh, troops, and who are the criminals among them. But because of a uh, misperception, People thought he's aiding them and the rest of them. And let me tell you something. Uh, there was a visit he undertook to Niger State, a forest in Niger State, when a student of a government secondary school, Kagara, in Niger State, were abducted. That visit, he was accompanied on that visit by policemen and Nigerian soldiers. So you can see, the government knows what he's doing. Gumi himself knows what he's doing. But I can tell you, to the best of my own knowledge, he is never uh, the problem. What is, the, uh, what is the, the missing gap is that there was no understanding between him, the public, and the government to come together to understand the whole issue and see a way or how Gumi as a person can help to solve this challenge of banditry and insecurity in the northwestern uh, part of the country. I believe he, he has uh, the clout, he has the influence to actually talk to some people involved in this criminality. But because of misperception, uh, misunderstanding of his uh, initiative, I demand hands off and say, okay, he's no longer interested. And see where we are today. Hmm. All right. Um, we move on from uh, the leadership newspaper now and look at stories coming in the nation, uh, a newspaper. Uh, President Sibuhari, not part of the plot to draft Jonathan into race. And uh, according to the paper, they are quoting a National Working Committee member of the party is saying that uh, the former president is not qualified to be uh, the standard bearer of the APC. Now, this is um, uh, goes against the news that came out last week that said that despite uh, Jonathan not submitting himself for any screening or for any uh, uh, form, uh, personally picking up a form or submitting it, that since the group had picked the form for him, that he, uh, along with others who had like a Mayfield and um, uh, addition of the um, AFDB uh, uh, um, uh, head, that they will be screened by the party despite the fact that they probably refused uh, uh, the forms that were bought for them by members of the public. So this is now different. Um, what are your thoughts on this? If indeed the chairman of the party had said all those who uh, whose name had been used to pick forms will be screened, and now an NWC member is saying that um, Jonathan is not part of the race. Uh, what do you think he forms this future? Well, uh, the statement by Asu Rock yesterday uh, was very, very important in the sense that it will actually uh, allay the fears of some of the major contestants in the ruling of Progressive uh, Congress, like Ashwa Jubala Ahmed, Tinubu, Vice President Emil Shibaju, and the rest of them who I can tell you they've been unsettled with the mention of Jonathan as the anointed candidate of President Muhammadu Buhari. But then the statement is coming late, just one week to their own uh, uh, convention. Their convention should be taking place uh, maybe uh, the other weekend, uh, 6th and 7th of uh, June. So this is coming rather late because this story uh, started, you know, emanated weeks ago, many weeks ago, that Jonathan will be flying the flag of... Uh, APC and the rest of them. But I think it is good that the presidency came out to say, well, Jonathan, uh, President Buhari is not part of the plot to drag Jonathan into APC and to make him uh, uh, the anointed uh, candidate. Then secondly, before we, I came on this show, I saw a list uh, on the social media that APC has released the list of uh, 22 or 23 uh, presidential aspirants to be screened as presidential aspirants of the party. And the name of former President Kudo Jonathan is not part of the is not part of the list. Then I, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know how Jonathan will be contesting without joining APC formally in the first place. No matter the waiver, you must first be registered as a member of the political party before you can enjoy the privileges members of the party, you know, enjoy. So Jonathan has not, to the best of our knowledge, has not registered officially 
as a member of the APC, whether in Abuja, uh, yes, whether in Bayelsa or Abuja. So he has not done anything like that. So I don't see Jonathan as a member of the APC in the first place. Then secondly, I just concluded a PDP uh, national convention. I don't know if you see a page on their uh, program on the social media where the picture of Jonathan was, uh, you know, Jonathan was listed as one of the former president and member of the party. And that tells you again that Jonathan at no time formally you know, quit the opposition major uh, People's Democratic Party. So there's, anything, there's nothing like that. He didn't quit the party officially. So for them, he's still their member. And in APC, he's neither here nor there. He has not formally registered. So there is no way he can be a presidential aspirant. All right. Um, some, some will say, you know, Dr. Jonathan has not really been seen with the PDP um, in, in recent time, especially about since he left office. Um, he's not uh, attended their meetings and he basically just uh, has been absent from the party. Whilst there uh, also exactly. suspicion that he uh, supported the uh, APC candidate for governor in that state. I'm um, talking about Lyon, uh, you know. So, I mean, should we should we take what the party is doing seriously by putting his face in the uh, convention program? Well, yes, he has stayed away from the party. He has been avoiding the party. And like you just rightly said now, uh, in the last year election, was it last year, 2020, 2020 or 2021, a governorship election in a Bayasta state, he was seen openly supporting the then uh, governorship candidate, David Leon. Now, that seemed like anti-party uh, for the PDP, but then there are due processes. He never at any time officially, you know, uh, approached the party to say, I am no longer your member, as you have seen with other people, you know, defecting from one party to the other. So there are due process. And that, is, that was why the PDP listed him as a member, a former president, on their program at the just concluded uh, national convention, special national convention, where Atiku was uh, elected as a presidential uh, candidate. So for him, it's a dilemma. He does not belong to A, he does not belong to B. He's just hanging at the middle. And that's not too good for his uh, presidential aspiration. If at all, he knows anyone. Hmm. Okay, so probably he can join President Muhammad Buhari in saying, I belong to nobody and I belong to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that seems to go down in history. Um, but so it should just remain a statement. If the statement already should remain a statement. All right. Like former President Lucia Bambasanjo. All right. Do you think probably this will come as a sigh of relief to the proponents of a southern presidency? Because, of course, the Jonathan... Uh, con contested, even though there are legal, legal questions around that. But if he managed to contest, it would be for only, uh, to be president, it would be for only one term. Uh, probably a sigh of relief for the South. Well, that's one game that so many people, you know, are projecting, and a lot of people are also against it, that, okay, why should you use Jonathan as a pawn in a political chess game? Why should you draft him to come to serve your own interests, your purpose, to just come spend four years and go back to the power I uh, know we return to to the north. Well, I, I don't believe in all those uh, uh, conspiracy, you know, theories because power as it is now, we all know, is uh, served a la carte. Uh, it served as a buffet. Power is never served a la carte. You can't sit down and get power. You have to stand up, look for power, grab power. So the gentleman agreement of a uh, rotational presidency, you can see now, it will not work again from 2023. Article is the candidate of the PDP, so be it, is the candidate, and you know, he stands the chance of winning the 2023 presidential election. He's a known person, he's a veteran politician, and the rest of it, he can win. And if he wins, it means power is staying back in the north. But which are part of the north, not eastern part of the country, which people also say has never tasted the presidency like the southeast. So for me, I don't believe in this uh, rotational thing. What I'm always after is who has the capacity, who has the competence to actually take this country out of the wood. Like Atiku said, I like what he said, I want to unify the country. And that's one of our foundational problems for now. This unity, there is no unity. And you can see the crisis all over the place. So as we speak, we don't need a southern president or northern president. We need a Nigerian president that will unify the country, that will take us out of the woods as we speak. All right. Interesting. Um, we'll, stick, we'll stick with the nation newspaper this morning. Um, EFCC uncovers another 90 billion naira fraud against the accountant general. This is in addition to uh, the initial 80 billion naira uh, fraud that is being investigated. So if you add both, I think you have about 170 uh, a billion naira 
Uh, just a few lines from the paper and the article. Uh, it says that uh, Idris, who, is battly, or who was battling for bail last night, has opened up on some uh, top government officials allegedly involved in some transactions. So uh, it seems that he's um, uh, you know, exposing some of those who are his collaborators, uh, some of the papers covering uh, the headline, to include Governor Yari uh, as being complicit in all of this. Your thoughts on, on, on this now? $80 billion. Well, uh, yeah. Yeah, please go. Yes, I want to commend the EFCC. What the EFCC is doing of recent shows that uh, no one is above the law in Nigeria. We used to see people being above the law. But in recent times, uh, I think the narrative uh, might have changed with the arrest of the accountant general, the suspended accountant general, Ahmed Idris. And uh, maybe from what investigation they are conducting, they discover again that uh, former Zamfara State Governor Abdulaziz Yari has a case to answer. But that is all enough. I think there is a need for some uh, reform in our electoral law and even the constitution, as the case may be. For example, Yari just paid a senatorial ticket in Zamfara at the weekend. He will be representing, I think, Zamfara Central. Central. Uh, he will be contesting for Zamfara Central senatorial seat in the 2023 uh, general election. Now, if anybody has a question to answer, if anyone has been indicted, such person, even though people will say, no, no, that's not fair, an accused is presumed innocent until proven guilty. But in my own case, I want to believe if you are indicted, you should stay away from the political arena, from the electoral process, until all processes are concluded that you are either guilty or not guilty. Because as we speak, he's in detention now, I can tell you, before election, he might get bail, he will become a senator, probably, and again, he will continue the case again as a senator. He might be going to court, court and be coming back, you know? And all those things, for me, are disgraceful. A public officer of that standing should not be seen going to court and coming back or going to detention and coming back. So for them, people will tell you, no, no, we don't do that. It's against uh, fundamental human rights. Uh, if anyone is presumed, uh, is accused of anything, is presumed innocent until uh, proven uh, guilty. I remember in, uh, in Abia State, a former governor won the election while in prison. He's no, he's no longer a governor again, but he won the election while in prison. Also, the, now, uh, sec the new secretary of the APC, Senator Yola Omishore, also won a senatorial election in Osho State while in prison at that time. But thank God, the cases have been cleared. But I think the idea, the case is still on, you can imagine. The case is still on. He, he was a governor for eight years. He has vacated office, and the case is still on. And the case started before he became the governor. You can imagine. All right, interesting times indeed. Um, this is probably one of the biggest uh, time. Yeah, swoops and probably biggest cases under Bawa, the EFCC head. What, what are your thoughts on the performance of Bawa uh, as head of the EFCC since he, he became, uh, came into that position? Are oh, you talking about the EFCC chairman? Yes, yes, indeed. Okay, Abdul Rashid Bawa. I, I think the young man has been doing uh, a lot. He has been doing a lot. So I just told you now that uh, oh, I used to believe certain persons above the law but with the recent event i want to tell you yes the narrative is changing but not completely changing because i know that my cases started way back in 2007 and those cases are no head they have no headway as we speak you don't even know whether the people are still on trial or their cases have been concluded let me cite an example former governor of uh, jigawa state who was governor from 1999 to 2007 uh aminu saminu turaki is on trial but you don't know the status of that trial, whether it's still on trial or whether his uh, case has been concluded. What we have been seeing is the manipulation of EFCC by the Office of the Attorney General of the Federation. Because EFCC is under the presidency through the Office of the Attorney General of the Federation and Minister of Justice. And you can see, of course, that we hinder to a large extent the, 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 the operation of the EFCC. We learned that the new chairman, a good man, that is, but he was nominated by the current Minister of Justice and Attorney General. Of course, he will give him directive on what to do and what not to do. We've been seeing a lot of reports about who to, who to be put on trial and who not to be touched. That should not happen in the same client, in the same society. But then, that's what we are seeing. But with what I've seen recently, I want to believe the narrative is changing and it will be changed for good.
All right. In the, indeed, uh, hoping the narrative will change and it will change for good. A very worrying story on the front page of the Nation newspaper. The uh, paper says that the uh, prelate of the Methodist Church of Nigeria, uh, His Eminence Dr. Samuel Kalu Uche, and a bishop have been kidnapped in Abia State. This uh, happening around uh, in, in Umu, Neochi, local government area of Abia State at about 7 p.m. yesterday. Um, the police confirmed the incident which has thrown the church hierarchy into fear over the safety of their leader. It's there, once again, you know, brought up the issue of insecurity in the southeast. Um, quite a number of the kidnapping incidents uh, don't get reported in the press. Uh, I know a few of them that have not made it out to the newspapers. Your thoughts on this, uh, Bode? Well, you know, the, the press, uh, the Nigerian press is not a spirit. <laughs> yes, I know. I'm just saying that it, it, it's uh, a, yeah, know, all I'm saying is, uh, a, you know, is, more, is a grave situation <laughs> even more than what we read about. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Now, I think the insecurity in the Southeast is something that needs uh, special attention. It's different from the kind of insecurity we have in other parts of the country. In the Northwest, for instance, you will hear people telling you, even security experts telling you that ah, the bandits that are terrorizing the uh, Northwest are Fulani from another part of the uh, from other part of the world. For example, there are Chadians, there are there are Nigerians, and the rest of them. You know, but in the Southeast, it is very very clear from the videos we have seen, from the reports we have read, that it's an in-house thing. We have seen. Ibo, speak, people speaking Igbo, killing people, killing same Igbo, and making videos. You understand? Very, very terrible thing. So I don't know what the federal government is doing, but then the federal government might also find itself in a fix as to how to confront the problem, in the sense that people will say, oh, whenever there is a problem in the Southeast, the crocodiles will be smiling, the python, uh, the python will be dancing. You know, these are military operations previously in the region. Uh, but when things are happening in the North, uh, nothing like that. Well, it's a problem. It's an Nigerian so, problem. So does the federal government, is, yeah, does the federal government stay back and say, okay, well, we will not guarantee the safety of Nigerians because people are saying these things? And, and, and that is not, you know, uh, that is not expected of a government that is firm, decisive, you know, and without discrimination. So I think whatever it is, government should be on top of its game. This is Nigeria. We have a Nigerian president. And thank God you said something earlier. You reminded me something that the president said on May 29, 2015. I will be president for everybody and I will be president for nobody. You understand? So he should prove that statement in this instance. But what we have seen so far is a president who pay more attention, in my own estimation, to one, to one, to one issue than the other, which is not necessary. A Nigerian president is a Nigerian president. And this will further make people to be disenchanted. This is what I make people to be, to be saying we want to break away, we want Biafra, when there is no sense of belonging. So this insecurity in the Southeast is a peculiar one, and it should be confronted in, short, in a, such manner. And government should do something before this issue will go out of hand. Now look at the person that was kidnapped yesterday, the prelate of the Methodist Church. When I saw the story, I didn't believe it initially. I thought it was a fake news. The prelate of the Methodist Church. No, no, no. This is one thing taken too far. And I think our government should come out, all out to actually confront this once and for all. Hmm. And of course, I'll join all uh, people of goodwill, I'm sure including yourself, to, uh, to uh, call on those who have abducted uh, Dr. Uh, Samuel Kalu Uche to, to please release him. Uh, Dr. Carlos Samoluche is a good person who is simply out there on humanitarian grounds as a, a, a man of God, a preacher, um, leading people, including those from the Southeast, um, on their journey of salvation and, uh, you know, of course, you have uh, charity uh, as part of the work of, of the church. And he's also a member, uh, uh, an indigent of the Southeast. So how do you, what point do you make when you kidnap such a, a person? Please let him go. Uh, but it, we would stick, uh, st look at a few more stories before we say um, uh, goodbye to you. Let's just take uh, one more um, from the Punch newspaper. Um, of course, we have a Port Hackett Stampede, Church Mourns, uh, Traces, Victims, Families uh, Club shot. Talking about the Port Hackett Polo Club. And this is in reference to uh, uh, the charity event that was meant to hold on Saturday in Port Hackett called Shop for Free uh, by the King's Assembly. Your thoughts on that, very quickly. Well, uh, 
it's very pathetic. Uh, that, that was an event that happened, uh, a sad incident on Saturday in Port Harcourt. Mm, well, I think we should be more conscious of our crowd control measures wherever we are organizing events that involve crowd. At times, you know, we don't care that some things, uh, we are having a, uh, a religious program and God is in control, so we should not do our own part. And I don't think that is uh, uh, good enough. I don't know what those people in Port Harcourt, what measures they took, uh, arrangement they made for the program. But this has happened. I, I think uh, we can only pray for the repose of the souls of the victims and also think out of the box and see how these incidents will not happen again anywhere. It is a sad in, uh, mm. incident, and we pray uh, that the soul of the departed uh, will rest in peace. Government should quickly do something to ameliorate the pains of the families of the victims. First, government should quickly move in. Government should not you know, say, oh, this was a private church matter. It does not. No, 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 no. This is Nigeria. We have a government in place. Government should quickly, beyond issuing a statement to say, oh, we mourn the, de we mourn the dead. No. Let's quickly move in to, 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 to cushion the pains hmm. of the, the families of the victims and see how this will not occur again. These are very, very important in the circumstance. Quite a staggering amount of number of people who died. I mean, if it's one person, it's still a pain. Um, exactly. Yeah, exactly. but 31, it's, it's quite sad. Um, uh, you had mostly, you know, children, mothers, uh, 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 elderly people who come off of this event. I say so because I've been part of it. Uh, but the, the, the police spokesperson in, in Lagos State is saying that um, uh, people were there earlier than the event was meant to start at, I think it was meant to start at about 9 a.m. and they were there by 4.30 a.m. and uh, that some of them got impatient and started rushing, which led to the stampede. But, but, but I would like us to look at this, and this is an interesting take by Al Jazeera's Fidel Simba, who is in Abuja. And he has reminded us that um, there was an incident where, uh, uh, and I remember this one in Port Harcourt, where uh, a non-government organization tried to give uh, some free items, um, sort of palliative and donations to the poor. Uh, eight people passed on and died. That's the Ink Nation, is what they call them. I remember that one very clearly. And also in um, the northern part of the country, in Bornu State, uh, an aid agency had a food program where they were trying to distribute food items, and that also saw seven women trampled upon and trampled to death there. Uh, why would you think, why do you think when it comes to this charitable, you know, uh, 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 activities and donations, like the food incident in the north, you know, people die. Very, very shortly, please, because we're out of time. Unfortunately, it is a manifestation of the failure of the government. The examples you cited, people were, you know, scrambling for food. Why should people scramble for food in the first place? Hunger. Hunger. So why do we have hunger in place? Who should address hunger? The charity organizations are only doing their own bits to help. But in the course of helping, something unpleasant happened. But should they be scrambling for food in the first place? So you can see the whole thing boils down to governance, lack of good governance, hunger everywhere, lack of gainful employment. So a program that ought to take place by eight people now, we're there by 4.30, 4 a.m., just because of hunger. Very, very unfortunate. And people in government position, in governmental positions should cover their, their face in shape whether at reverse level or at the federal level, beyond issuing a statement. Very, very unfortunate. It's a failure of government. Thank you very much, Bodek Badebo, who is the online editor of the Leadership Newspaper. Really a pleasure having you join us on the uh, Newspaper Review segment right here on Plus TV. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. All right. Uh, we'll take a break to look at what happened today in history. And uh, when we return, uh, we'll look at the emergence of Atiku Abubakar as presidential candidate of the People's Democratic Party. Please stay with us.